Uh, thank you all for uh, joining this uh, meeting. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everywhere if you are. Uh, I want to thank the ASME of Talmology International Conference for this uh, invitation. Uh, and also, especially Dr. Mohammed Al Amri and Dr. Barol for this organization for Glaucoma Sessions. Uh, Glaucoma Session 2 will be as revisiting for medication for glaucoma. With me and the panel, panel, as panelists, Dr. Suresh Kumar will be in here. As uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar, a professor at the Department of Thalmology, government medical colleague and hospital uh, chant are in India. Also as panelist on the first presentation with uh, Dr. Shibal, Dr. Shibal will start the fire and the war here with the prostaglandin war. Do we have a winner? Dr. Shibal uh, Bartia, uh, a senior consultant of ophthalmologist for this Memorial Research Institute in India. After that, after this war should be also one of, out of the game. For that, I will present our beta blocker still in the game. My name is Ali al Sheikha, consultant ophthalmologist and the glaucoma surgeon in another hospital in Oman. After that, we go to the safe side, to the medication that we need as drops or as uh, systemically with Dr. Yasmin. Dr. Yasmin al sayyad she is a professor of ophthalmology and the Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University and Egypt. And always we said, old is gold, but not always the, we need the old, but still old is valuable, but is it still usable? That we'll see with uh, Dr. Basil to speak about bilocarbine, dead or alive. Dr. Basil Fa'u remind dear friend in Syria and now practicing in Al Garhoud Hospital in Dubai. And the last but sure not the least, Dr. Barol will see what is the positive and best of preservatives. Dr. Barol, she is a professor of glaucoma and the neuro-ophthalmology service, Department of Ophthalmology, Government Medical Colleague, and the hospital in India. And with that, I will stop my sharing, and we hope with that we have time for discussion at the end of the session. Here, I stop sharing my screen. Good evening, yeah. everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, well, I have the impossible task of walking you through the prostaglandin wars and um, no financial disclosure, actually all financial disclosures, I kind of speak for everyone and consult with everyone, but none that are hopefully relevant to what I'm going to say. Um, going to start off by talking about what really is critical to glaucoma diagnosis and management. Remember, every time you diagnose glaucoma, even before you start treatment, the patient's quality of life drops. That happens because the diagnosis is scary. And as you start treating the patient, the minute you start the patient, the quality of life of the patient decreases. That's because of side effects, as well as the terror of having been diagnosed with a disease which is progressive, chronic, and potentially blinding. And it is this that we are treating, not the intraocular pressure. And that is critical to remember when making any clinical decision in glaucoma. And I think that is the crux of what we try and do as glaucoma specialists, to make sure that there is no decrease in the quality of life of patient as the glaucoma progresses. And therefore, we must remember that our treatment must be kinder on the eye than it is. And for this, I'm moving from a very medical point of view to a very strategy point of view. So what then for any ophthalmic technology assessment is the state of best practice? We must remember that there is the non-price buyer value which is delivered in anything that we buy. So let's say buying a car and you're looking at the BMW and the Toyota, the non-price deliverables for the BMW are far superior to that of Toyota, but is Toyota's strategy wrong? because the non-price at the relative cost position, you're looking at not only efficiency, but also delivery of value. So what then is strategy? The strategy then remains to find the best fit. For certain circumstances, the Toyota is definitely better than the BMW and vice versa. So therefore, it's critical to remember the production possibilities frontier. There is an infeasible production uh, area where there is no way we can reach 
in perfection. And there is an inefficient production area where we should not delve into because that's, a not, that's not the preferred choice for the patient. How do we apply these management strategies when we are looking at ophthalmology and very specifically medical management of glaucoma? Here, the price that we are looking at is the efficacy in intraocular pressure lowering and the non-price deliverable, which actually measures how else this is, is suitable for the patient, are the safety and quality of life costs, the duration that the drug remains efficacious, whether it is repeatable, and the economics of care. And this is critical to remembering when, in, when we are looking at anything to do with glaucoma, whether it is surgery, or it is a laser, pro, uh, laser procedure, or whether it is a, my, is a drug that we are looking at. And I would like for you to remember this as my colleagues walk you through the other uh, drugs that are used in glaucoma too, because it is very easy to assess a drug if you remember the strategy you're looking at. One, the price value, which of course in, in glaucoma is the intraocular pressure, and the non-price deliverables, which in glaucoma are primarily the quality of life determinants, those that determine compliance and adherence, side effects that also determine dropout rates, and the quality of life cost per millimeter of IOP. So what then is the true firepower in this particular war that we are fighting? Of course, it's IOP efficacy and response. So if we look at across the, close, the, the four major prostaglandins on the market, the efficacy is pretty much similar across class. It is 17% higher adjusted for bimetoprost and travoprost versus latanoprost and tafloprost. But, but this amounts to about a one, one millimeter decrease in IOP, which is, again, statistically not quite significant. But there is a higher adjusted response rate with tafloprost. That's because of the fact that it has two fluorine molecules which bind more to the, to the receptors. But what we need to remember from this particular graph is that almost all prostaglandins are equal in terms of intraocular pressure lowering. And all of these prostaglandins, if a particular patient is non-responsive to one, it doesn't mean that the patient is non-responsive to all. He or she may respond to another prostaglandin, so it is sensible to shift within class. And that is why when we look at crossover, also, these are the studies, and sadly, there are no head-to-head -head comparisons of all of them together. God knows why, but we'll get to that as well. But almost all of them are about equal. But bimatoprost does have an edge over latanoprost and tafloprost of the 1, 1.2 millimeters of mercury that we discussed. But how much, and these are all studies with 0 0.03 bimatoprost, how much does this translate into your clinical practice is something you need to remember and also realize how much does one millimeter of IOP change cost the patient in terms of quality of life. Remember the hidden cost of war is never what we see in this particular war that we are fighting, it's quality of life, adherence, as well as persistence with the therapy. Almost half of our patients who are on AGM have OSD. And for patients who have hyperemia, almost 60% of them will switch regimens and 30% will just stop medication and not come back to you. This is true for patients on prostaglandins. And therefore, recognition of the hidden cost of the glaucoma war, therefore, is the recognition and treatment of OSD so that that may improve both quality of life as well as adherence to the patient. Again, looking at conjunctival hyperemia across primary airport points, Tafluprost seems to be a little better than the others. Lisanoprost and Tafluprost are almost comparable. And since the study used 0 0.03 bimatoprost, it does say bimatoprost is a lot less kinder on the eye, but the 0 0.01 formulation is definitely kinder than the earlier used molecule. And this is also critical. And again, I think I'm setting the base more for my colleagues when they talk about it. Remember the economics of warfare. Uh, this is also to do with economics of how we look at studies. And it's very, very important to remember that all of the systemic reviews that you read in peer reviewed journals, whenever there is a financial conflict of interest that the author has disclosed, they will have more favorable conclusions and tend to have a lower methodological quality. It is not to comment on our ethics, but this is how it is. And sponsorship of drug and device studies by the manufacturing company invariably means that the reported outcomes are more favorable 
in terms of efficacy results as well as conclusions. Therefore, before you read a paper and decide which drug you want to choose, remember that in industry-sponsored studies, there is very little agreement when the sponsor is different. When you look at non-industry-sponsored studies, you're, the relative risk of that happening is definitely less. So this is the editor speaking when he says, read the review conclusion with skepticism, critically appraise the method applied, and interpret the review results with caution. So um, to have to find a particular uh, prostaglandin that is to be the best possible is very, very difficult. So what do we do then? Remember, you're treating the patient and not the intraocular pressure. So assess the patient as a whole, individualize the treatment. It should definitely be such that it provides IOP reduction. But because IOP reduction in the long term relies on patient cooperation, safety and tolerability of your choice of drug also has a serious, serious impact on patient adherence. There is no one clear answer in this prostaglandin war as it's true for almost all choices that we make in our lives. But you have to find to customize it to the best fit for your patient. And remember that the therapeutic window of all prostaglandins is definitely more than that of any other drug that we use in glaucoma. It has almost no systemic side effects. And most of the uh, therapeutic indexes, uh, indices as we're going to walk through the rest of the session, you will realize that this is a safe drug to use. And if one of the prostaglandins do not work, it's always, always sensible to try within class. So shift within class, choose the one which is the kindest for your patient's eyes, and that will be different for each particular patient that you see, and make sure that you customize the treatment to your patient's requirements. And remember, and sometimes, you know, we put too much uh, knowledge before wisdom and science before art and cleverness before common sense. And in glaucoma practice, it is so, so essential to remember that the one thing that we are treating is the vision-related quality of life, and that has to be individualized for each patient. With that, thank you so much for having me here. It's been an absolute pleasure to be amongst friends. Thank you, Parul, and thank you, Dr. Mohammed, and thank you, Dr. Ali, for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shival, for this very nice presentation. Please, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. Yeah, then I will start uh, sharing my screen now to save time. Now I will speak, are beta blockers still in the game? No financial interest. I will go through this point. As introduction, we know that this beta blocker was approved uh, from uh, FDA as uh, glaucoma treatment si since 1978. And since that time, until 1996, when prostaglandin analogs was approved as glaucoma medication was the first treatment. After that, start the debate, which is the first treatment and first line of treatment. Let me go through this point about beta blocker. We know that beta blocker decreases aqueous production. There is non-selective lower, lower uh, uh, IOB more than the selective, around 20 to 30% and compared to 60 to 20%. In 10% of cases, the response decreases with the time. We know there is short-term escape on long-term drift. On this medication, should, should not be installed at bedtime as this medication may cause significant drop in blood pressure. And we know that this IUB lowering effect is believed to be less marked during sleeping. We know that aqueous summer decreased around 50% during sleeping. The most known uh, beta blocker is the timolol available in many concentration used two times daily. On there is also debate can be used as one times daily at morning. The beta beta xylol is the only one selective beta blocker can use two times daily. There is also lovubinolol, cartulol, and metibranolol. But should be, be careful about metibranolol links with the granulatus anterior uveitis. The advantage for this medication is very well tolerated medication. This is only very few allergy or ocular discomfort due to burning, hyperemia, toxic, keratopathy, punctate keratitis. 
The most important is the systemic side effect that related to bronchospasmal cardiovascular disease and also less severe side effects, sleep disorder, reduced exercise tolerance, hallucination, confusion, depression. On this side effect can be decreased significantly by close the eye three minutes after drops or close the lacrimal bunker for 10 seconds at least with the finger. Since 2001, when this published this study as meta-analysis to compare the timolol and uh, prostaglandin analogous one found the slatter bros decrease IOP 30% in compared to 26 with timolol with more advanced, uh, more uh, preferred for prostaglandin almost around five millimeter mercury more than uh, timolol. And from that time, always we consider that it's the first line a treatment because it's one medication used only at uh, bedtime uh, with effective uh, decreasing IOB. But still, our beta blocker still in the game. Let me look about this point. A preference for beta blocker. We cannot use prostaglandin analogs all the time because we know this is when we have, uh, we need only treatment one eye, monocular treatment should be applied the prostaglandin analogs to avoid the cosmetic disadvantage on one eye as long lashes, thick long lashes on skin pigmentation. Also, there is contraindication, some contraindication as ocular inflammation, cystoid macular edema, history of herpes, simplex keratitis. In these cases, we prefer to avoid to avoid the prostaglandin analogs, and we go back to the, the old first uh, line, the beta blocker. The second point, the sustainable cost. We know according to the European Glaucoma Society, the goal of glaucoma treatment is to maintain the patient visual function and related quality of life at a sustainable cost. We know uh, that also that 97 of population across to be in developing world on the less developed country of Africa, Asia, and Latin America account for 80% of the world population. Thus, we speak about 80% of the population. Let me see this study published in November 2018. This is worldwide price comparison of glaucoma medication, laser, and trabeculectomy. Uh, Let me only concentrate about tumulol and latanoprost. There is here in this study 17 developed country and 21 developing country. And here in this study, if the medication costed more than 2.5% from the, annual, the main annual household should be considered as costed for this family. And what, let me see here how much costed. Timolol only in 5% of the country is costed more than 2.5%. But on the other side, latanoprost in around 41%, all this in developing country. The same group also published in June 2017, the price in many countries for prostaglandin analogous and beta blocker. And we find a big difference in the price and compare between beta blocker and uh, prostaglandin analogs and concluded this study that Timolol was the most affordable to become medication in all country study. Cost of care has been shown to influence not only adherence but also utilization of care and this is here ophthalmologists should consider cost when developing therapeutic plan for that is very important to consider the treatment when we speak about that we speak around 80% of the world. Third point, the need of more than one anti-glaucoma medication. How many from our patient need more than one medication? Let me go to the OTS study. Here eyes without significant optic nerve damage and at the risk of developing glaucoma, more than 40% of patients need additional medication within five years after starting the treatment to reach a modest reduction IOP of 20% of more. Here, 40% in five years. Let me go to the IGIS. In patient with a glaucoma, the number of patients required more than one drugs may be as high as 80% when the disease is more severe. This study also, 
Here, patient treated with the prostaglandin and what adjunctive therapy a pattern in the glaucoma patient using the prostaglandin and concluded that approximately 30% of patients starting a glaucoma therapy will require adjunctive therapy within one year and may many receive fixed combination. We know what the fixed combination is enhanced confidence, improve adherence, reduce exposure to preservative and possible cost saving. And if we look at the, this group of medication, only we have Simbrinza, Brinzolamide, and the Primoridine without beta blocker on the new in the world, but not available still here in our region, the Roclatan, Natrocetyl with Latonoprost. Otherwise, all the combination is with Dimulol. All prostaglandin analogous ties with beta blocker or carbonic anhydrase or bromididine, all this medication come as a combination with beta blocker. For that, when we need this in 30 or 40 on 80 percent, depend on the study, on the bend of the stage, we need combination that we need beta blocker. As a summary, are still beta blocker in the game. This is in the game on the main player or the sister reserve. We say this still in the game as effective toler uh, tolerable anti glaucoma medication, especially when there is contraindication for prostaglandin analogous, or when we consider the cost, or when we need combination. As here, this player can achieve the goal alone when the prostaglandin is contraindicated. Or here, when this is skipped as combination, we need as his goalkeeper come in front to achieve the goal when we need any combination. On some cases, also when keep this is reserved, this medication on the side on exclude the contraindication. On we added the medication, maybe this medication can achieve our goal and can make this goal for the treatment on the target pressure. And thank you for listening. That was really wonderful, Dr. Ali Sheikh. The football uh, analogy was really, really nice. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Now, the next speaker, Dr. Yasmin, please. Can you share your screen? Yeah, I'm sharing it. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for having me for this very kind invitation. It's really a pleasure to take part in the quick meeting. Um, my talk is going to be on the effect of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors on uh, ocular blood flow. So uh, glaucoma is an optic neuropathy that uh, ends in progressive retinal ganglion cell death. And we do know that glaucoma has uh, multifactorial risk factors, uh, a high IP be being the major risk factor and the only one that is clinically approved uh, for the management of glaucoma. Uh, but there are other risk factors that we know less about. And most of them rely on vascular abnormalities that have been reported. And they're very important because they contribute to the differences in uh, the resilience of the optic nerve uh, that we see in different patients. Uh, this is very valid when we're talking about NTG, but it also applies very much to patients with high pressure glaucoma, where patients who are less tolerant to uh, certain pressures require more aggressive uh, treatments and a lower target pressure. So vascular abnormalities do contribute to the development and deterioration of glaucoma in these patients. Uh, and there's been some uh, studies that have looked at uh, the ocular blood flow in primary open angle glaucoma patients. And they've shown that there is uh, blood flow deficiencies at the level of the retina, choroid, and retrobulbar circulations. And there's definitely a slower ocular blood flow velocity in NTG patients when compared with uh, high pressure glaucoma patients and in glaucoma patients compared to controls. Uh, POAG has also been associated with uh, abnormalities in the blood pressure, especially the nocturnal dips in pressure, disc hemorrhages, diseases that are associated with uh, abnormal autoregulation or vasospasms like migraines and uh, Reynolds disease. And all this suggests that there is a vascular element and that ischemia leads to more deterioration of the glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And conventionally, there are two theories that uh, explain the pathogenesis of glaucoma, and they 
they still stand a solid ground till now. And it's probably a combination of both of these mechanisms. The first is the pressure theory that supposes that the glucomatous optic neuropathy is due to a direct mechanical damage by the high pressure. Uh, and the vascular theory where the glaucoma is because um, of the damage of the vasculature or the compromise of the vasculature because of the mechanical effect of high pressure. And uh, there's another uh, problem with the ocular vasculature itself, with the ocular blood flow, be it related to the uh, lower perfusion pressure or uh, an abnormal uh, auto regulation in the circulation. And there have been studies that have looked at the effect of different anti-glaucoma medications on the ocular blood flow in an attempt to improve it uh, so that we may it may help us choose uh, which glaucoma medications to give to our patients, especially the NTG patients. But again, as I said, it applies to all patients because it improves uh, possibly the uh, nerve resilience. Uh, but what my talk today is going to be on the effect of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors per se. So what uh, carbonic anhydrase does uh, conventionally is that it catalyzes the conversion of carbon dioxide to carbonic acid, and then carbonic acid dissociates into bicarbonate, which is needed by the ciliary epithelium to secrete the aqueous. So if you block this cascade with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, you get less aqueous production and a reduction of IOP. But as other effects of uh, uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are being re re revealed, especially in other specialties. So in neurologists do know it's a well-established fact that there is a cerebral vasodilatory effect that they use uh, with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. It helps them in certain investigations and in treatment of patients. And it could be because of the carbon dioxide acc accumulation when it, less of it is converted into bicarbonate. So when it accumulates in the tissues, it lowers the tissue pH and the vessels dilate, and this may improve the, the ocular blood flow and circulation, uh, and uh, accordingly might improve the, uh, the oxidation or oxygenation of tissues. And there have been studies that have looked at the effect of carbonic anhydrases on ocular blood flow. This is a literature review that has reviewed 42 articles uh, that looked at the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors effect on ocular blood flow, and 32 of the 42 articles reported a possible increase in ocular hemodynamics with the treatment, uh, while nine other articles did not show any change in circulation, and one article reported a decline or a decrease in uh, ocular circulation with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. If you look at the studies, most of them use direct investigative tools like color Doppler, laser Doppler flow metry. Uh, but uh, we have to mention here that some of them have used indirect investigations that suggest that there is a problem with the ocular hemodynamics, but with a lot of assumptions filling some of the gaps. Uh, the other drawback of these investigation of these studies was that uh, you cannot exclude that the effect on the ocular blood flow of uh, the carbonic anhydrase could be because of the improvement in the IP. The reduction in IP leads to a higher perfusion pressure, and this can have its uh, positive effect on the circulation. So in order to uh, make sure that the carbonic anhydrases do have actually a good uh, 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 um, a positive effect on the ocular hemodynamics, you have to compare it with another drug with a similar IP lowering effect. So uh, there are at least three studies that have looked into that, and one of them has compared dorzolamide to betazolol uh, on the ocular, uh, its effect on the ocular circulation. And although both drugs had comparable IP reduction, only the dorzolamide was shown to, incre to increase the blood flow velocity by SLO. Another study that combined timolol and dorzolamide versus timolol and tanoprost, both drug combinations had similar IP reductions, but only the dorzolamide timolol group showed an improvement in retrobulbar uh, blood flow velocities and circulation. So all these studies suggest that it could be that uh, dorzolamide or brinzolamide do improve the ocular hemodynamics in a way. Uh, but um, oh, yeah, and lately, uh, the OCTA, which is a very important new tool to assess the ocular circulation, um, has been shown in this study from Taiwan. The group from Taiwan, they compared the cartilol, brimonidine, and dorzolamide uh, effect on the ocular circulation in NTG patients. Uh, 
And uh, interestingly, only the dorsalamide was associated with an improvement in vessel density, and that was at the superior nasal quadrants. Uh, on the other hand, cartulol actually decreased the vessel density, although not statistically significantly, and bimonidine did not have a significant effect on the ocular circulate, microcirculation by OCTA. So it could be that uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors do have a positive effect uh, on the ocular circulation, but there are some shortcomings to all these studies that we have to address before deducing con uh, conclusions. First of all, uh, the current ocular hemodynamic technologies uh, more or less assess the circulation in an indirect way uh, with a lot of assumptions that this improvement in, let's say, velocity would improve the circulation and hence the oxygenation. Uh, so we need more direct ways to assess if the actual blood or oxygenation of tissues is getting better with these medications. The second short shortcoming is that up to this point in time, we don't have a technology that is capable of assessing the total ocular circulation. So we cannot exclude that if one drug improves the circulation at some location, this would not be at the expense of it getting uh, uh, more compromised in another at another level in the eye. And finally, we need more evidence to support that all this has a positive beneficial effect uh, on the visual function. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yasmin. Yeah, please, can you stop sharing? Thank you, Dr. Yasmin, for this nice presentation. I would uh, like now Dr. Basil to share the screen. Dr. Basil. Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Basil. We set the time at the end, maybe half a few minutes for discussion because I had uh, not yesterday many, uh, many sessions. The last speaker didn't have the time and always make the presentation very short. <laughs> yeah, please, can you start? Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to be with you today and this uh, nice uh, meeting uh, today. I will talk about uh, bilocarbin. Is it uh, dead or still alive? Indeed, uh, all of us, Please, uh, Dr. Basil, can you make full screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, now? Yeah, okay, now, thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, as a definition, pilocarpin is a, a muscarinic cholinergic agonist. Use it on the eye to treat elevated intraocular pressure, various types of glaucoma, and uh, to induce meiosis. And uh, also it's uh, available orally to treat the symptoms of a dry mouth associated with Jogren syndrome and radiotherapy. Indeed, as a mechanism of action, pilocarpin is a cholinergic parasympathomimetic agent. It uh, increases uh, the secretion by the uh, exocrine glands and produces a contraction of the iris sphincter muscle and ciliary muscle when given topically to the eye uh, uh, by mainly stimulating uh, muscarinic receptors. It is the chemical formula for pilocarpin. And it's available in the market as ophthalmic solutions, 1%, 2%, 4%, and as uh, eye gel also, 4%. And, uh, as a tablet, 5 milligram and 7.5 milligram. In, uh, as an indications, uh, it's uh, used for uh, radiation, induced dry mouth, xerostomia, and symptoms of a dry mouth in patients with Jogren syndrome, uh, 5 milligram orally every six hours, not to exceed 30 milligram per day. And what is important for us today is to talk about the indications in glaucoma. Uh, we know that uh, pilocarpin used it before for the treatment of chronic uh, simple glaucoma, but now uh, when uh, other uh, anti-glaucoma medications available more and causing uh, uh, more uh, uh, reduction in the intraocular pressure and with less side effects, so uh, pilocarpine uh, uh, not uh, 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 not uh, generally use it as other types of anti-glaucoma medications. 
especially in uh, primary open angular glaucoma and uh, also uh, we will see that it's uh, contraindicated in the subsecondary glaucoma uh, as we will see in, in next slides but in acute and intermittent closed angular glaucoma uh, pilocarpine is still working well with us uh, either alone or uh, in conjunction with other agents to reduce intraocular pressure prior to surgery treatments also we are uh, uh, so for, for this reason we can use pilocarpine in acute angular glaucoma intermittent angular glaucoma uh, to prevent uh, closure for the angle uh, as the pilocarpine will cause uh, restriction to the uh, pupil and uh, pushing the iris road away from the angle uh, preventing the closure of the angle we can use this for a short time unless we do either laser iridotomy for example or to do surgery for those patients uh, as a long-term treatment uh, and uh, in this case uh, pilocarpine will be used for a short time not for a long time uh, pilocarpine can be used as a meiosis to contract the effects of cycloplegic or midriatic eye drops in a low concentration 1% solution in affected eyes. So, pilocarpine sometimes use it immediately before certain types of corneal grafts, for example, in penetrating keratoplasty, uh, we are apply pilocarpine before the surgery. This will cause the pupil to be uh, small as much as we can. So the iris will uh, play as a barrier to prevent any damage for the lens during the surgery. And also in DMIC and DSIC procedures, uh, when uh, we have to inject a bubble gas in the anterior chamber uh, to uh, tamponate the graft in place, uh, we need to uh, 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 do uh, uh, to, to apply uh, pilocarpine before the surgery to prevent the gas uh, uh, bubble from escaping behind the uh, iris. Uh, 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 so for also a pilocarpine uh, up till now is uh, very helpful for us to be applied before YAG laser iridotomy. Uh, as we know, pilocarbine will stretch the tissue of the iris and uh, this will, be, will uh, cause uh, laser iridotomy to be easier to us uh, with pilocarbine than without pilocarbine. Uh, also for iridoplasty, uh, yes, iridoplasty not is a common uh, procedure as before, uh, but it's still sometimes we have to do it for uh, patients uh, in cases of iris plateau, uh, for example, or intermittent closer angle glaucoma, uh, and uh, applying a pilocarbine before the uh, laser uh, procedure will be helpful for us in these cases. Uh, for trapeculoplasty, laser trapeculoplasty as SLT, ALT, and NLT, usually we are doing these procedures for open angle glaucoma, but sometimes uh, uh, for some reasons, we have to do this procedure for angles of uh, plus two uh, uh, open uh, angle glaucoma. Uh, and uh, when we apply pilocarpine, the angle will be uh, uh, opened more for plus three or plus four and making this procedure easier for us. Uh, but uh, finally, or uh, last year uh, in two, uh, 2021, uh, FDA they approve it pilocarpine hydrochloride as an eye drop treatment for uh, presbyopia uh, with a concentration of 1.25%. And we will wait the results of this medication for presbyopia uh, treatment because, as we know, uh, yani, uh, if is this uh, eye drop will be effective with all patients for presbyopia management. Uh, they uh, told us that it will improve the uh, near vision for three lines at least, but uh, we will know uh, or uh, we will see if this will be helpful for patients of uh, previous uh, hypermetropia, uh, for example, uh, how many lines they will gain, uh, are they will be tolerated uh, with the side effects of these medications. We will see uh, after months, maybe studies uh, will uh, tell us about that. Uh, as side effects for uh, pilocarbine, uh, as we all know, uh, bro-egg uh, 
and uh, breakdown of a blood aqueous barrier. It's very important, breakdown of a blood aqueous barrier. That's mean for any case, when we have any inflammation inside the eye, pilocarpine will uh, uh, not be a good choice for us because this will increase the inflammation inside the eye. So pilocarpine uh, should be avoided in, uh, for example, uvascular glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, uh, after procedures or surgeries for the eye, uh, because uh, uh, pilocarbine will uh, increase the breakdown of blood aqueous barrier and uh, uh, that will be uh, uh, lead to a pain for the patients and discomfort and uh, uh, so we have to avoid it as much as we can. Uh, pilocarbine causes lens iris diaphragm to move anteriorly, so in cases of uh, uh, when we uh, uh, try to avoid any uh, anterior uh, displacement of iris diaphragm, uh, as in, uh, uh, for example, malignant glaucoma, we have to, uh, 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 pilocarbine will be a contraindication medication in these cases. Uh, pilocarbine will decrease night vision because the pupil will be small. Uh, pilocarbine will uh, cause variable myopia. Uh, sometimes causing tear, retinal tear or retinal detachment, uh, possible anterior uh, subcapsular cataract can happen also. So uh, the contraindications for pilocarbine, uh, which will limit the use of uh, pilocarbine, uh, hypersensitivity to any component of a polycarbine, anterior uveitis, as we mentioned, will be contraindication to uh, use uh, pilocarpine. Some forms of secondary glaucoma, as uh, we mentioned before, uh, new vascular glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, malignant glaucoma, uh, pilocarpine will not be helpful uh, for these uh, secondary glaucomas. Uh, it's not suitable for patients using contact lenses, so uh, we can't use uh, it with contact lenses. Okay. Hello. But, uh, sorry, uh, I disconnected the internet from my side. Okay. Hello. Pilocarpine, pilocarpine as a medication for uh, uh, treatment of glaucoma uh, is uh, uh, not alive for uh, chronic treatment of a glaucoma, but it's uh, uh, good and helpful for us uh, to be used uh, pilocarpine, pilocarpine in uh, some uh, subtype of glaucoma as intermittent closure angle glaucoma or acute closure angle glaucoma until we do surgery or laser for the patients. Pilocarpine will be helpful for us before uh, some procedures as uh, like laser aerodotomy, uh, as we mentioned before. And now it uh, can be uh, used for uh, presbyopia treatment, uh, uh, and we will see the result for this in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basil. Please, can you stop sharing? I already stopped. Please, Dr. Barol. Can you share your screen? Well, good evening. Um, I'll be talking about the positives and perils of preservatives. So when we look at this ballerina, what we look at is the elegant dash form. And what we often ignore is the feet, how much grunt they have borne for all the practice the ballerina goes through. Similarly, when we are treating a patient of glaucoma with the several drugs that we prescribe to them, what we often ignore is the adverse effects, the ocular surface disorders that pursue after chronic polypharmacy that we often subject our patient to. So before we go any further, it's important to understand what really formulates a drug. All the drugs, be it anti-glaucoma drugs or any other drugs that we prescribe, have an active ingredient and some excipients. The excipients include preservatives, and uh, for the sake of simplicity, for my entire talk, I would be using BAC as the chief preservative as it's used in almost 70% of uh, ocular formulations. Um, we also have some buffers, the most common buffer being the phosphate buffer, some viscosity agents and vehicle. So usually um, preservatives are supposedly the culprit for any adverse effects, but Everything cannot be all good or all bad, and therefore preservatives, just like any other thing, are a mixed blessing. Uh, BAC, as, we, as I mentioned, uh, was one of the first to be introduced as a preservative. It's a quaternary ammonium compound, which uh, has some detergent-like qualities, and that's what accounts for the adverse effect profile of this preservative. The newer 
other than back preservatives like polyquad or soxia, they are more docile, but they have an issue of the fact that they are associated with branded drugs. So the cost factor becomes a very big issue for these back, other than back preserved drugs to you know, be used extensively by all patients. Uh, preservatives are effective against pathogens, but as we know, they were not specifically designed to be friendly to all the cells of the eye. Um, I would really recommend everybody to go through this article, which really talks very beautifully about preservatives and eye drops, the good, the bad, and the ugly aspects about them. So uh, this is a very brilliant read, and I wouldn't be doing any justice if I don't talk about this. Uh, so before we talk all bad about the preservatives, let's look at some good. Uh, preservatives are bactericidal and fungicidal, and they prevent microbial growth in the drugs. They increase the shelf life of the drugs and they allow the penetration of the drugs by affecting the cell to cell junctions. And in fact, recently Lumigan has shifted from 0.03% to 0.01%. Although they have reduced the percentage of the active ingredient, they have quadrupled the amount of back in the drugs so as to have a better penetration of the drug. And additionally, preservatives keep the cost of the drugs low. Um, some perils now. Well, preservatives have, are there not only in anti-glaucoma drugs, but they're also in other uh, artificial tears or any other drug the patient takes. And especially for glaucoma, it becomes all the more concerning because they have to put these drops for their entire lifetime. So it's years spent into tears because of the extreme amount of ocular surface disease that ensues with multiple men anti-glaucoma medications. What we usually see is the tip of the iceberg and the detergent action actually kills not only the superficial conjunctival and corneal cells, but also deeper trabecular meshwork cells. Um, studies have shown that installation of just a single drop of 0.01 percent back halves the tear film breakup time in even healthy volunteers. What to say of patients who are putting multiple medications. Additionally, they also cause contact allergies. Um, preservative blood and ocular surface can absolutely be compared to this poor animal who is overloaded and definitely not able to function. And that's what happens to the eye. And it has also been seen that glaucoma patients with concomitant ocular surface disease, they experience about four to 12 times more uh, therapy side effects than those with only glaucoma and on not any medications or just a single drug. Now, since we know that it's a chronic disease with polypharmacy for almost an entire lifetime, the long-term back exposure, it stimulates the ocular surface immunity and results in adverse effects like toxic endothelial degeneration, conjunctival foreshortening and shrinkage, ocular pemphigoid-like condition and decreased corneal sensitivity. Uh, Having said that, that it increases the penetration, if it's so nice, why all the companies don't reduce their active ingredient and increase back? Actually, studies now have also shown that it's actually a histological toxicity that is having because that is occurring because of increased concentration of back and rather than it just being used as a means of improving penetration. So what seems to uh, increase the drug penetration is actually the tissue dying because of the extra uh, back that we are putting. Not only the superficial conjunctival and corneal cells, the trabecular meshwork cells, they also start getting degenerated. There is oxidative stress to the trabecular meshwork cells. There is DNA fragmentation of these cells and the trabecular meshwork over a period of time starts getting compromised. The back toxicity is edited, uh, not only by increasing concentration, but also by the prolonged use of the drug. The dose-dependent toxicity can actually cause the entire anterior segment to be affected. Now, if the lab studies show back to be so bad, why are the clinical studies not correlating with them? Why are still so many countries and so many drug, uh, drug companies still using BAC? Now, um, one of the main reasons is that the toxicity in real life is not as pronounced. 
back per se is hydrophilic and hydrophobic and it gets dissolved once it hits the surface. A part of it gets dissolved once it hits the surface. Clinically, the concentration of the back also reduces into your film very rapidly once it hits the eye. So if the patient is putting just a single drug, there is not too much to be bothered about unless they have an extreme amount of sensitivity to it. The chemical binding also reduces the amount of free back. And additionally, if the patient is on a prostaglandin analog, antioxidant effect of prostaglandin analogs may explain the relatively high tolerance of such medications. Having said that, again, coming back to the point that those who are on multiple medications eventually need surgery. So back compromises the outcome of the surgery and results in more chances of failure of the surgery because of the decrease in the goblet cells and increased number of fibroblasts. Is it wise to point all fingers just at preservatives? As I mentioned, that the drugs also have something which is called as buffers. And phosphate is one of the most commonly used buffers and the concentration of the phosphate should be somewhere close to the physiological level of about 1.45 millimoles. But about half of the anti-glaucoma formulations have shown phosphate concentrations to be at a much higher level. And that can also compromise not just the ocular surface, but also the quality of life of the patient. Now with newer dispensing mechanisms like ABAC or APTAR vials, which have microporous filters within them, um, it is possible to have non-preserved drugs uh, in a multivial dispensing formulation and which can last for good 40 or even 60 days with the APTAR drug bottles. So it's time that we turn our back on back on preservatives the back alternative preserved medicines can definitely be used if your patients can afford them. And um, it's now time to look forward to this technology. And if we are prescribing drugs which have preservatives, it's a good idea to note down subtle symptoms of ocular surface disease at each visit. So we just need to remember that we don't do any harm to our patients, their ocular surface and their quality of life. Thank you so very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barrow, for this uh, nice overview. Uh, now we have three minutes. We can uh, make discussion. And uh, uh, Dr. Shiba. Yes, please. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this is here from, from your experience. If uh, this is about this is the prostaglandin analogous, trabatan or exalatan, about the side effect, burning, redness, and uh, orbitopathy. If you compare, which you prefer? So zalatan is definitely kinder on the ocular surface as compared to trabatan. And, uh, but also there is the efficacy lag then. So it's actually, it's, an, it's, it's a no-win situation. You have to compromise on one to win the other. For that is, is because I not see many patients here as the burning is uh, not that is at the first of one week two weeks but the patient is not tolerated on the stop the medication and yes. in spite of this, as according to the company this is more uh, uh, stable in the temperature for this is in our calf area should be the travatan this advantage and compared to the zlatan but the patient is not tolerated this medication to continue according to that. Uh, yes. Any question, uh, Dr. Yasmin? Uh, according to this study, Korean study, this is a, uh, this compared the bromididine and the bronzolamide for the vascular density, but not compare uh, according to this uh, ganglion cell when finding this is better on. And how long this exactly. is the, the effect of vascular density? How long after? How long? I think it was six months minimum. Uh, but it just proved that the uh, neuroprotective effect of brimonidine is not possibly related to its vascular, its effect on the vasculature, rather possibly a direct effect on the ganglion cells. Uh, it's interesting. But of course, we need more studies. We can't just hold on to this one, uh, but it's a good study. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any question, please? Any question uh, for here? I think just to comment. Um, I think all of yeah. us analysts here will agree that, uh, you know, different patients react differently to drugs. And the crux of today's 
the entire seminar is that we must customize and individualize our treatment. You don't know which patient will do well with which drug and, and no drug can be dismissed as old or not important enough because there are patients who will do better with, you know, with something you thought will never work. So that is critical to remember that each patient is one data point and any of these studies that we read, and even if we were to remove all kinds of bias from the studies that we do read, uh, we don't know where that particular patient will fit on that particular curve. So each patient is your individual study each time. There are certain broad guidelines of glaucoma management, but thereafter, the only thing that makes you a good glaucoma doctor is if you are customizing to the needs of your individual patient. There will be patients who will find Travitan to be kinder on their eye than the Tanuprost, than Zalatan. There will be some patients. So it, if, yeah. and, the, and probability has no memory. So it's not like if you have 20 patients, 19 will react in a particular way and the 20th will react differently. So uh, none of this, you know, the only thing that we take away from each seminar is that every single patient is an individual. And what we do for that patient must be customized to his or her needs and aspirations. For that, this is the very good point because now uh, always any patient comfortable one man, one uh, prostaglandin analysis, I try not to change because if you change, you have the problem, especially if the patient comfortable with the medication. Absolutely. Only one point I forget, maybe I forget to highlight it about the betaxolol. This is many consider the betaxolol is safe in asthma. Uh, betaxolol also as the timolol is contraindication in asthma patient. This is maybe a many, uh, many colleague and here with the hearing us because I find this special for the resident or the new fellow. This is if when the patient have asthma, give this is maybe stop the timolol if find on timolol or start with betaxolol say this is more safe. Bitaxolol also is contraindication in asthmatic patient. Maybe it's more safer if the patient has uh, pulmonary any symptoms, but is if this diagnosed asthma or COVD or patient and inhaler is contraindication because still we didn't know what is the exact mechanism for beta blocker until this time, unfortunately. Uh, I think with this, uh, we uh, now over the time, two minutes, I want to conclude this session. Thank you all. Thank you to see you here. I hope to see you physically, is not virtually. And thank you, Dr. Barol, for the organization, Dr. Muhammad Amri, for the, and the committee for this conference. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.